the wind uh, wind stuff. You know, I was out here for a couple of years uh, at uh, Holloman, and so I'm familiar with the wind and the dust storms. And uh, it was interesting over in the uh, over in the side. I visited the uh, uh, JSC facility out there, and uh, they don't like the stand down days. We we used to love to have the uh, Dust storms come in because we'd get inside the hair and we'd work all the engineering problems that we'd been putting off, putting off, putting off. So I, uh, I uh, really felt at home being greeted by a dust storm. So you were stationed at Holloman Air Force Base 58, 59, that time frame. Flew the Sabre jet? Well, actually, I was working as a flight test engineer on a B-52. We had a, uh, I was working for McDonnell at that time. I had just come back from Korea. And uh, I was working as a flight test engineer in one of the very early uh, B-52s. And uh, our job was to adapt various weapon systems to the B-52 airframe. And at the same time, we had a variety of secondary tests. The uh, Quail missile uh, that we were developing used the J-85 engine, which was used in the T-38. So we had a trapeze we would swing down out of the bomb bay. It was a... Uh, incredibly successful test program and it was one that uh, brought me uh, into what I'd say is the hands-on uh, side of the job and it uh, really helped me as I moved into the space program just a few years later. What was Holloman Air Force Base like then? <laughs> Holloman Air Force Base was probably one of the most exciting places I'd ever been in my life. I'd been used to uh, uh, fighter operations at various bases uh, stateside and overseas but uh, yeah, John Paul Stapp just a few years earlier riding the rocket sled. Uh, while we were out there, Joey Kittinger did his uh, free fall out of the balloon and uh, did the free fall almost exceeding the uh, speed of sound at that time. I believe he's just a few miles per hour short, according to this uh, gentleman who's going to try it for this uh, Red Bull extreme mm -hmm. athlete that's getting ready for uh, his free fall. 125,000 feet. Uh, but uh, there were uh, there were uh, there was something going on every day, and uh, we were stationed. Our our hangar was next to what they call fighter missile uh, test branch, where they had aircraft from every uh, friendly military service around the world uh, testing uh, and being adapted to the various sidewinders, the Gar Falcons, and all the air-to-air -air missiles that were being developed over here. Occasionally, we'd go out in the range, and uh, you know the uh, army was developing the uh, various Nike uh, uh, ground air uh, missile systems. Uh, they had uh, targets shooting down these beautiful B-17s, and the and the uh, Q-2 uh, drones that they had out there. I mean, there was something going on every minute of the time. It was it was heady stuff. Were you there when Ham and Enos were being trained? <laughs> no, I wasn't, but I got familiar with Ham and yeah. Enos uh, once we got to Virginia because uh, the, uh, their monkey doctor uh, used to live right down the uh, street from us, and uh, we'd uh, ride in together. We had a two-place car with three people in it, and uh, basically we'd ride in and hear all of his war stories about the uh, training of the animals, and uh, it was interesting. He had a uh, true affection. I uh, love of these animals, and, and to me it was just, let's get on with the program. I don't even know why we need to uh, use animal subjects. Why don't we put the, the man in the loop there? Because I believe that uh, uh, the people who worked the Mercury program were very convinced that man could perform in space. We didn't, uh, we didn't need to uh, have some monkeys running pellet machines and getting banana pills to uh, see if, uh, demonstrate that uh, people could still perform in a weightless environment. So was that Ed Dittmer? Pardon? Was that Ed Dittmer, his uh, trainer? Uh, no, I'm trying to remember <clears throat> what the what the name was. Uh, that was so long ago, you know, as, as you get older. I'm approaching 80 right now. <laughs> a lot of these things have just sort of fade to black in the background there. But uh, it, was, it was an incredible time out here and uh, as we moved into the Space Task Group. I know Ed uh, worked with him at the base. He still is there. He's 93 yeah. years old. Yeah. So you actually, when you're out at the base, wanted to go back to uh, flying status. <laughs> and the Air Force said no, and you saw an ad the back of Aviation Week. Well, I, uh, I uh, had been flying fighters, and when I come back from Korea, they put me into tankers, and I wasn't interested in flying tankers. I was a fighter pilot, and uh, I... Uh, Came and I hoped to get in the back seat of one of the uh, F-101s. McDonnell was doing the F-101 testing, 
out here. They were doing the, some of the uh, auto attack programs, and uh, I thought, gee, that would be a great way to crack into the uh, flight test business. And instead I ended up in a B-52 out here, so it shows how the world changes. But about midway through that program, I thought, gee, this is, I came to love that airframe. And I thought, let's try to get back into the Air Force and see if they'll have me. But uh, when you turn uh, Kurt LeMay down with his uh, bomber force down there, he's not interested in getting some people who turn him down once. So uh, that led me to, I uh, remained with the uh, program that we had out here in Holloman as we were getting ready to wrap up. I saw an advertisement in Aviation Week, a magazine that said they were forming a space task group, and I thought, gee, that sounded uh, pretty cool. Uh, that might be the next adventure, because I've been fortunate all through my life that basically I was doing what I loved every minute of the day, every second, and it was just a passion that, uh, that uh, had, I had grown up with as a result of many of the people that I worked with and trained with. And, and uh, I thought, gee, let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at space. And uh, I wanted to go down to the Cape because I thought uh, launch operations down to the Cape was the place to go. And uh, my wife uh, basically said, no, nah, Gene, what you got to do is you got to get more education. You ought to go back to Virginia. You ought to work at headquarters down there and go to some of these uh, great schools they have in Virginia. So I ended up out in the, uh, at the Langley Research Center, which was headquarters of the Space Task Group. And uh, I arrived, and they had basically a pool of about uh, six to eight uh, young people who were, uh, they were still forming up. They had about 100 people total in the space task group. And some people were going to engineering, some people were going into recovery operation, do the testing of the water systems and figure out how to get them aboard the aircraft carriers or destroyers. So some were going down to launch operations down at the Cape. And I was just sitting in the bullpen. And uh, one day, about two weeks after I'd been on board, a gentleman comes up. I knew him by sight, but I didn't know him by name. He says, I'm Chris Kraft. You're working for me now. And then he said words I'll never forget. He says, uh, I want you to go down to the Cape and uh, write a countdown, write some mission rolls, and when you're through, give me a call and we'll come down and launch. And I'd been two weeks in the job. All I'd seen is the various manuals for building the spacecraft. I didn't have a clue about big rockets. Uh, the spacecraft was virtual unknown, and it was just, okay, uh, military background, you salute Chris Kraft and go down and figure out how to write a content. And uh, this uh, brought me into first, uh, my first meeting with the, with the astronauts because uh, literally I was so green at this new business that I hopped aboard. NASA had its own uh, uh, mini airline. It was East Coast Airlines, and we hopped aboard the airplane, got down there, and I didn't know whether the Cape was north or south of our landing field once we got down at the Cape. And uh, I uh, was standing sort of in the door of the aircraft getting out trying to figure out what to do next. And up drives this uh, convertible, and uh, beautiful red thing. And you know, all of a sudden, one of the uh, other guys that had been on the aircraft with me he sort of walks down there and looks at me, just wondering what to do. And he says, uh, "Where are you going?" I says, "I'm going out the Cape." And he says, "Hop aboard." And this was my first introduction. I found very quickly that as we were going down the gate and up A1A down there, and the, and the uh, air policeman at the gate sort of gave this guy a highball. And uh, all of a sudden, we're just must be hitting pretty close, 70, 80 mile an hour. And all of a sudden, the guy reached over and he says, "Hey, I'm Gordo Cooper." And we shake hands, and that was my introduction. And so Gordo became uh, the guy I was always rooting for to get the first flight to do this, to do that. But he was he was absolutely a joy. He was probably the most. Uh, passionate, enthusiastic. All the other guys were steely-eyed missile, missile men uh, in the uh, original Mercury 7, but Gordo was a guy who just loved every aspect of his job, and he, he just enthused it. I mean, he gave you the same enthusiasm he had. I have read that, and you, you mentioned countdowns, which, which on the surface would seem, okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> uh, I've read that the kids, uh, there's a joke, the kids at NASA, because the rockets were blowing up in the early years, yeah. learned to count down 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, damn! <laughs> but, but the countdown involves, as you, as you discuss in your book, failure is not an option. You have to coordinate that with early engine starting and boosters, and it's all a very precise uh, 
mechanism. Yeah, we were, we were very fortunate because at this time the space community was relatively small and they recognized how far we had to go. So when I first started off uh, getting into the business trying to ride a countdown, uh, obviously you go to the blockhouse. Now I had heard about a blockhouse. This is where everybody's encased in a cement uh, facility down there up near the launch pad so they can see what's going on there. The guys do the countdown push the button. So I met this is my first uh, meeting with uh, Tom O'Malley, and he was the Atlas test conductor in this time. And Tom was such, in fact, the entire launch team was uh, such, they tell you, they say, well, we're, I'm going to be working over at Mission Control. I'm right at Countdown. Uh, what are the kinds of things that uh, we ought to work together on? Yeah, obviously, communications. Obviously, we're going to bring up a command system. So basically, you're going to be sending various commands off to it. We're going to have telemetry. So he sort of guided you through this, and then he says, well, the next guy you ought to talk to is range safety. And I said, who? And he says, well, range safety. He says, that's the guy that uh, they have these uh, vertical wires out there, and they're looking at, uh, as we launch, they got to make sure that we don't tilt back towards the launch pad or towards the population, and they got the ability to blow up the rocket. So I said, okay, go and meet the range safety guys. And then we uh, met the range safety and we uh, spent some time at, at uh, taking a look at the various observers they had. They had observers situated around the launch complex and they had a, a little grid. And uh, basically this grid uh, gave them the indicator as to whether the spacecraft was going vertical. And if it was not going vertical but tipping back towards the uh, launch uh, population area, They'd uh, let uh, range safety, uh, uh, these were observers, the range safety officer, you know, uh, tell Mercury Control, hey, we're deviating in trajectory, do you see it? And Mission Mercury Control would say, yeah, we're seeing it. And he'd say, well, you got 20 seconds. If you uh, got a crewman on board, you better get him off. You know, it was that kind of a relationship. Well, after getting to know a bit about range safety, then I had to figure out uh, something about the spacecraft. So now let's go over to Hangar S and talk to the people on the spacecraft and uh, who are the various test conductors etc and and so this was this process of finally seeing these pieces come together and writing them down and uh, then, the, then the next part of the job was to develop what we call mission rules well the mission rules uh, in the early days were very similar to uh, what we uh, what we use in aircraft and uh, what they have uh, every time you go on a commercial flight today. You have a minimum equipment list. These are the things that you got to have working uh, in order to say, hey, we're going for launch. Well, that was the early part. But then once you've launched, what do you got to have in order to keep going in the path that you want to go as opposed to aborting? Because you have, you have conscious decisions you have to make all through powered flight. So this was the uh, this was the next part of the job, but then the most interesting one, and to me it came as sort of a shock. I expected to see a fully professional team of people come up and show down there for the launch countdown, but it was sort of like uh, remember in Sandlot uh, softball where you'd, you'd have two teams divide up, you'd yeah. have one guy get the bat and throw it to the other guy, he'd get up, and then you'd keep going up the top, and the guy that got to the top of the bat got first choice of players. <laughs> Well, that was sort of how we how we built the the launch teams because uh, Chris Kraft at that time had only uh, three guys that were full time uh, controllers, uh, two of which worked the trajectory, plus myself, plus himself, and that was that was the team. Everybody else had to be borrowed. So he'd go over over to engineering and try to convince two guys to come over from engineering, and you'd go and say, okay, we need a doctor here uh because basically pretty soon we're gonna launch a man so we want this doctor to become part of the team then you had to go to the uh air force and get somebody that was capable of talking about the range facilities we had so all of a sudden you get this team coming together for the first time this was before you really had any real simulators so you would run uh, basically a, a paper simulation a paper countdown and uh and you'd go through this thing, and then you'd learn to say, Roger, go, go, go. Or you'd say, okay, hold on, I'm going to check. So it was, it was sort of like uh, just uh, play acting. Hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, it was time for our first launch. And uh, our first launch, Mercury Atlas 1, blew up shortly after liftoff, so that was sort of the end of that mission. That's what you call the four-inch flight. That was that, that, yeah. Well, the four-inch flights are Mercury Redstone. That was, that was the one that was really a stunner. And that, uh, uh, 
uh, brought me right back to some of the things that I had learned out here in flight test at Holloman because uh, we were launching our first Redstone rocket, and the same thing. We only had two televisions in mission control, one at the flight director's console and one down at the spacecraft uh, communicator. He was an astronaut down there. Uh, why they gave those two guys televisions and nobody else, I don't know. I guess they didn't want us to be distracted by things that were moving. They wanted us to look at meters and dials. So anyway, we finally got to the point where we sent the firing command, and we saw the great big billow of smoke come up, and it really wasn't smoke, it was basically just steam coming down from the water injection, the launch pad steam's boiling up around, and all of a sudden something takes off and boom, it's going like a shot. And uh, we'd never seen a rocket launch before, and Chris Kraft, you know, is looking at this thing on TV, and he says, did you see that? I said, yeah. And we were both looking at that thing, and then all of a sudden the television camera pans down and the rocket's still in the launch pad. We hadn't launched the rocket, we launched the escape tower. Well, this started, this started what turned out to be a, 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 a not too swift day. Because the next thing that comes out, we see a great big wad of stuff come out, and it's a parachute. And then it comes out some chaff. They had the strips of aluminum foil they used from a standpoint of tracking, and then die markers that came out of the top of this rocket. And then the parachutes start to inflate. And then we said, my God, if, if we got the wind coming off the ocean, this thing's going to tip over and really be a mess now. So then it's, what do we do about it? And uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion. In the meantime, to add further to this confusion, our rocket engineers weren't speaking to us. They were speaking in German to the people in the blockhouse. So we had no clue what they had seen, what they had done. Uh, so now we finally concluded we had a live rocket on the launch pad with no control over it. And uh, so now somebody says, what are we going to do? And they say, well, we've got to reconnect the umbilical. Well, pretty soon we got the information from the launch pad that that had been pyrotechnically severed. There was no way to reconnect the umbilical. So then the discussion is uh, go out and get a cherry picker and some pruning shears that you use and cut the risers on these parachutes before it blows over. But nobody wanted to get that close to a live rocket. So then somebody says, why don't we shoot holes in the tank with a, with a rifle? So they're going out to security to uh, get a rifle out there and see if uh, that's the way we want to go. Well, at this time we wrote the first true, real rule in mission control. If you don't know what to do, don't do nothing. And that served us very well because we sat there for the best part of about uh, 10 hours as we watched the batteries deplete, and this, the way that they had designed the system was if you lost all power internal to the rocket, all the valving would go to a safe position, it would vent the pressurized tanks and everything else, and then you could approach it safely. And uh, this is what we decided to do. And this was our, uh, this was uh, uh, probably our greatest learning mission that we had had in the very early days, because we found out uh, that we absolutely knew nothing about the systems we were working with. The sum, sub the sum substance of our knowledge on the spacecraft was what was called a pocket checklist that was designed. It was a uh, uh, checklist that was about uh, six to eight inches high and probably about five inches wide, and it fit into the flight suit of the astronauts. And, so, and there was nothing about the booster in there. Uh, so all of a sudden, say, we got to get a heck of a lot smarter. Now, the one thing that goes back to Holloman, whenever we had a flight test going on with our aircraft, every flight test engineer worth his salt has got some integrated schematics. He's got the drawings the thing was made from. If the pilot calls down, you got a problem. If there's some problem with the test, you want to be able to give them some straight answers because range time and flight time was very expensive. So basically, you had to be the guy with the answers. Well, we did this by developing a series of integrated schematics of the systems that we were flying. They weren't the greatest. A lot of them were hand-drawn on the back of just a piece of paper or you'd sit down with the engineers or the mechanics and figure out how things worked. But uh, this led me then to start in the direction that says, from now on, this team is going to have knowledge of the systems that they are launching and going to fly. 
So this was sort of the beginning of a very steep learning curve as we went through Project Mercury. I've got to take a break, but I want to ask you this question. I have heard this story that when they would lock the astronauts in the capsule in the white room, everybody else would go away. All of a sudden, you guys down in, in Mission Control would see on the on the monitors the heartbeats of the astronauts start to increase, <laughs> and nobody could figure it out. And the astronauts certainly didn't tell anybody that that Gunner Vent is that how you pronounce Gunner Vent yeah. would put pictures of naked women on the windows, and that was what was called. There, there was uh, there there were all kinds of tricks that they played on board there. So that's one, true. One of the uh, I can't testify to that because uh, I uh, I wasn't in that place, but I ca I can testify. That uh, remember the uh, the comedian Bill Dana? Oh yeah. And basically, he did the Jose Jimenez, the reluctant astronaut stories. That yep. whenever it got boring in the launch countdown and uh, things were getting sort of tense, uh, while somebody was working the problem, they would uh, launch director uh, would bring up one of the Bill Dana segments in there, and we just listen and you know. And I think back as to how, I won't say casual it was, but basically this was a very personal, emotional. Uh, we had an attachment at each other. We were truly a brotherhood in those days. So this was the way that we had done business. We knew the risks. It was high risk, but we also knew that you had to had to live with it and you had to power down periodically. Today, if we played some of these uh, kinds of tricks uh, over the launch pad, the people would be fired. We've lost our sense of judgment in in the kinds of people that managed uh, incredible risks of space life. But uh, in those days, we were all, they'd call us cowboys today. But uh, we weren't cowboys, we were thorough professionals. All right, 7.30, Gene Krantz is our guest. We've got more to talk about. Let's take a break. We'll come back. I heard that your favorite song is Stars and Stripes Forever. Mm -hmm. So I have a 78 at home of the original Sousa band <laughs> playing that. And I also have a record player, too. So we'll hear that when we come back. Five years and come up on the end of it. Uh, uh, <coughs> we can fade out of it if you want. Ready? Here we go. So there is John Philip Sousa's original orchestra playing Stars and Stripes Forever. That's a great, just makes you feel good about our pride and accomplishments in this country. Yeah, the uh, Stars and Stripes sort of became my, my moniker from uh, very early in my life. I. Uh, my father died when I was seven, and uh, uh, my mother had three kids to raise uh, right after the Depression with no insurance, so she turned her house into a boarding house. And this was during uh, World War II, and uh, we lived right next to the USO, so basically the USO would send uh, the GIs over to the house, and these be people who lived there became my heroes. And uh, from that uh, day forward, I just had an intense love for country and patriotism and, and respect uh, for the kinds of people willing to risk and sacrifice. So that all through my career, as I went, then went into the military, Stars and Stripes became part of the day. But the thing that became interesting was one of these uh, eight-track cassette recorders uh, uh, came into play. And the first thing, I, I had one put it in my, uh, my uh, I had a Mercury, uh, small Mercury, and basically uh, uh, right off the bat it was stolen. So this time I riveted that sucker in so nobody's going to take this. Well, we had six kids, and all the kids I would drive them to work or to school right on down the line. So the first thing they'd hear every morning was uh, Stars and Stripes Forever. And uh, they made a deal that I had the uh, radio and the record player in the morning, and they had it in the afternoon coming home. So we had a, a two-way deal there. But uh, I had, uh, all through my career, uh, every meeting I ever had in mission control when they were talking about where we're going, every staff meeting I had always started off with Stars and Trek Forever. In fact, as I was approaching the end of my career, I moved into the uh, headquarters building out at uh, Johnson Space Center. And I picked the office, which was directly opposite the flagpole. So right out that window, I had the American flag. And every morning, I kicked off our uh, teleconference with all my people, half hour before work started, uh, with stars and stripes forever. So that was, uh, that was part of my life. It was, uh, I love it. Your autobiography <clears throat> is Failure is Not an Option. And I want to talk about Apollo 1. That was really the first national tragedy in the, in the space program. Uh, three astronauts died because of it. 
you you said something, and I think I'm paraphrasing in here, but you the support crew NASA mm -hmm. failed the Apollo One crew. Yeah, this was uh, this was we were uh, truly in a race. We had uh, transitioned very quickly. In fact, uh, during the late Gemini program, we had two uh, mission control rooms in our control center. Uh, one in the third floor, one on the second floor, and we'd be. Uh, actually flying a Gemini mission on one floor and we'd be training for an Apollo mission on the other floor. So we were overlapping. So the, uh, the uh, preparation that we had for what we were doing in Apollo was not as complete or as rigorous as it had to be due to the other duties in support of Gemini. And uh, I had, uh, as we were approaching the, uh, the Apollo 1 mission, we were roughly about 30 days out and the launch date had been slipped many times. Uh, I was the uh, flight director. With, uh, three flight directors for that mission were Chris Kraft, myself, John Hodge, and Elishman, and uh, and uh, then myself. I had the white team. And the uh, day before the uh, uh, test, we ran two tests in sequence: what we call a plugs-in test and a plugs-out test, both of which are countdown dress rehearsals for a launch. And uh, we were about one month out from the launch, and. Uh, the uh, day before, I had run a plugs-in test, and we staggered. We had communications problems that were unbelievable. The test procedures just didn't, didn't hang together. But by the time we had finished that test, I had managed to patch, uh, patch around the majority of the communications problem we were having with the, with the launch team. And we moved directly from that test into the plugs-out test, which is now a full-blown dress rehearsal and including the final minutes of the countdown where we transition from external power in the launch pad to internal power in the spacecraft. And uh, basically I kicked off the countdown that day and then handed over to Chris Kraft generally around uh, noontime. And he continued the countdown, but basically I remained in place uh, until he got into the, uh, the uh, uh, actual countdown where the crew was involved. And shortly after the crew moved into the spacecraft, Gus Grissom, you know, had reported this spacecraft has just got an odor inside it. I don't understand what it is. It's, it's horrible, like, you know. So basically, you report an oxious odor inside the spacecraft. Communications problems continued. Our test procedures just, just didn't hang together. And we struggled through that afternoon. And uh, frequently calling a help, countdown, hold, sort out problems, continue on hold, sort out problems, continue on until finally at 6.27 that afternoon. Uh, we again went into a hold before we transferred from external power in the launch pad to internal power in the spacecraft. And uh, four minutes after entering that countdown hold, uh, the control team was startled by screams coming from the crew and they listened to their crew as they died. And uh, with their death came anger because we knew we were responsible for America's first space disaster. And uh, throughout that uh, late afternoon and evening and into the night, uh, we kept looking at trying to find the cause. What was the reason for this? We secured mission control. We couldn't communicate out. Uh, various experts came in. We uh, basically uh, saved all the recordings, all the records we had had for the launch. And then uh, we have a watering hole that when times get bad as well as in good times, uh, sing the wheel. We go over and we had a few beers that night, and many of the controllers had to call their wives to bring them home. And uh, this was this was this was very difficult in the team because myself, Hodge, and Kraft had worked in flight test. We had worked through the Mercury and Gemini program. We fully understood the risks of the business, but we had a bunch of young kids now who, for the first time in their life had faced death and they faced the fact that in some way they were responsible for this. And then they nailed down the team, but I've had to find some way. I had worked, as I said, out at Holloman earlier in the day, and basically I had a, a little plaque that I had that I carried through Holloman that says, unlike the sea, aviation accidents are high technology accidents and aviation accidents are completely unforgiving, a carelessness, a carelessness, incapacity, or neglect. And basically I started off because I was chief of the flight control division. I had the responsibility for all the controllers and the flight directors. And uh, basically I started off that talk that day that basically indicated that there was
is no way to pass the buck to anyone else. We had to assume total and complete responsibility for the failure that, you, that we had had. Because we knew we were not ready, we knew the procedures weren't ready. Uh, basically, uh, we just were running, we were drinking from our fire hose, and we were behind the power curve. And then I finished with basically the uh, fact that from now on this team in mission control will be known by two words, tough and competent. Tough meaning we will never again shirk from our responsibilities because we are forever accountable for what we do, or in the case of Apollo 1 and our crew, what we fail to do. Competent will never again take anything for granted. We will never stop learning. From now on, the teams in mission control will be perfect. And those words uh, set the stage for the work that we would do in the uh, following years that took our nation to the surface of the moon, that basically addressed the problems we had during Apollo 12 and, and launch phase where we hit twice by lightning. We had Apollo 13, which, which we had a disastrous explosion 200,000 miles out in space. And the odds of bringing the crew back successfully were, uh, were very limited, very dicey, but, uh, but the team pulled this thing off. So for the rest of our professional career, we lived by those two words. We designed a badge, the emblem of the mission control team, and the price for admission to our ranks for discipline, morale, toughness, confidence, commitment, teamwork, because as a team, we must never fail. So I believe that the teams, we came away from that massive failure in Apollo 1 with a totally different resolve that we would never again be accountable for such a failure. We would never make, we would from then day on make sure it would never happen again. And this held true all the way through the early years into the uh, space shuttle program and all the way through the shuttle. Those words served us well. Let's take our next break, come back and talk about our greatest triumph, Apollo 11 and, and what you did on Apollo 13. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's Walter Brennan. I'm sure some folks remember Walter Brennan, but he did that song about John Glenn, which I don't know, it's it's historically interesting, but it's kind of cheesy. <laughs> uh, Apollo 11, let's talk about that. There's a quote in your book uh, in the chapter We Copy You Down, Eagle, where they had landed on the moon, I believe, and you got on a private loop with your flight controllers and said, today's our day, the hopes yeah. and dreams of the entire world are with us. Uh, and you ended up with, you are a hell of a good team, one that I feel privileged to lead. Whatever happens, I will stand behind every call that you make. This was a, uh, this was very important because the, uh, I think very few people recognize how young that team was. Uh, I was the oldest guy in the room that day at 37. My team members' average age was 26. The majority were roughly four years out of college. And uh, this was something that had never been done before, and we were going to take an American to the moon. We were very well trained for it. But it's also important to let people know that uh, whatever happened that day, the thing that was interesting, and, and it was very stark, uh, throughout every training session, we had uh, we go into what we call a battle short, where we physically block all power breakers going into the building, and then we lock the control room doors. And when we lock those doors, they will not be reopened until we have either landed in the moon, we've crashed, or we've aborted the landing. And there's only uh, one of those outcomes that is good. And uh, I think it was very important for the people to recognize, my team to recognize, that I would stand behind every decision they would make because I understood how difficult, I understood the risks that were involved, I understood the fallacies of the people that were in there. But as a team, we must not fail. And uh, this turned out to be very important because uh, one of my controllers, in a documentary we did, expressed it. He says that was exactly, those words were exactly what he needed. And in fact, he says he, I didn't put it in the book, but he says Kranz also added another set of words to that. He says, I'll stand behind every decision that you make. We came into this room as a team, and we will leave as a team. And uh, he expressed that, and he basically indicated that that was what gave him the conviction to stand up and make tough decisions that day. And Steve Bales 
was the guidance officer who would, uh, who would address these uh, challenges that we had in the computer. It was a battle to get to the surface. As soon as we cracked the hill and we, act, we acquired the spacecraft, uh, we had communications problems, so immediately we had to start relaying everything that we were doing through Mike Collins in the command module. At the same time, uh, <laughs> my flight dynamics officer, uh, Jay Green, came up and said, Flight, I don't know what's happened, but we're halfway to our abort limit. And that is a word that you don't use casually in mission control. And boy, I mean, everybody listened up to that. And basically he says he'll keep watching. And they indicated we were out the radio component of velocity, and the concern there was the orbit could be tipped so that we could actually be impacting the moon further on down the orbit without ever knowing it. Uh, this was our uh, very limited knowledge we had in some of the technologies of early space. But uh, then we had uh, minor navigation. We had that minor navigation problem. We had a minor electrical problem. We fought these battles. We made the go-no-go -no -go to start on down, and at which time then we have to look for the landing radar to come in so we can update the spacecraft's knowledge of its altitude. Uh, and as we were waiting for that landing radar to come in, uh, that's when we started having a series of computer program alarms. Uh, and that's when Steve Bales had to step up and make some calls. Is Are we safe to go? Yes or no? Go or no go? And as we were doing that, we also recognized now we're going to be landing long, which means the crew's going to have to take over to higher altitude. And we fought this battle all the way down. Now, the fuel tank of the lunar module was basically a cylinder with a rounded end in that thing, and basically once you move past the cylindrical portion, we no longer had any gauging. It was like driving your car running an empty and you wonder when you're going to run out of gas. Uh, well, basically, in the testing that we had had, we knew that at an average hover throttle setting where the crew wasn't ascending or descending, we had two minutes of propellant remaining. So we had a guy with two stopwatches in the back room, and basically we got a single analog trace, and basically he's following seconds above 30%, seconds below 30%, looking at the watches, subtracting them, and that's how we got uh, the calls that made as to how much fuel we had remaining. Uh, we heard the call at uh, 90 seconds, and then 60 seconds, then 45 seconds. And now it's time to start making decisions. We've got a 30-second call, and now we're looking at a land abort decision. We know the crew's pretty close to the surface uh, because they're kicking up dust. And at the time that we would have said 15 seconds, we recognized the crew was going through shutdown. We had just landed on the moon's surface. But at that time, we were also faced with a land abort decision, which would have been the most complex and riskiest decision that we had made in the history of spaceflight. And then the problem, everybody's cheering, the world's cheering, the people behind the viewing room are cheering, but we got to now go through a series of stay-no-stay no stay decisions. we got to keep working. Two minutes after landing, we got to say, is it safe to remain on the surface of the moon for the next six minutes? So eight minutes after landing, we had to make a stay-no-stay no stay decision. Then we had to look at the spacecraft, and two hours later, we could give the crew the go-ahead for power down. So while the whole world's celebrating, we're still working to make sure that it's safe to remain in position on the lunar surface where we were. So that was a pretty sporty day, but that team hung together, and uh, these words, uh, stand behind every decision that you will make, really became very important. Well, you know what, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to ask you about Apollo 13. You decided that that was not going to be a repeat of Apollo 1. It was, uh, it was, uh, could have been a disaster, but but you guys worked and brought them home. Yeah, this was this was probably uh, uh, the team. By this time, the uh, mission control team was a Super Bowl championship quality, and basically we took uh, the challenges of that mission and basically we met them head on. We made the difficult decisions. The team worked together. There were many, many, many players. It wasn't just the flight directors. I had Arnie Aldrich doing the procedures. I had John Aaron doing the resources. I had people addressing survival issues. We had astronauts coming on to work the simulators. We got word in from our contractors throughout all over the United States. We got people at the University of Toronto giving us ideas as to, as to separation techniques that we could use to minimize perturbations to the orbit. And, you know, it was really amazing to see this team come together and wrap their arms around that crew. 
And we were extremely fortunate because we had a very professional media in those days who understood the risks of the business and they gave us the benefit of the doubt every time we came to talk to them and give them the status. They were actually in the control room and basically we were operating uh, under the observation of the media, television, written word, and basically the, uh, the radio. And uh, we lived in that fishbowl for the entire period of time of Apollo 13, but uh, we came out the far end, we saved that crew. Well, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us. You're going to be out at Holloman, your old haunts. <laughs> I looked at that moon this morning and I thought, man, I wish we were still going there. I cannot imagine what goes through your mind. Yes, it's, uh, it's a time. I, uh, I had hoped that in my lifetime I would see Americans back on the moon again. Now I'm just hoping that in my children's yeah. lifetime they will see that. All right. So we'll, we were inducting you at the museum on Saturday, and we appreciate your time. We could go on another two or three hours, but... Well, we've got, we, we've got some more time coming we up, do. so I'm, I'm sure we'll explore other, okay. uh, other options here. All right. So let's go out on Aquarius. That just goes way too fast. <laughs>